Okay, we're going to take a meditation today, um, pr primarily from Matthew's Gospel, though we're going into Luke's as well. We are going to be a bit inundated with Scripture, but you know, no matter how much Scripture we ever read at a church service or in our liturgies, we'll never come close to what the Puritans used to do in the 16 and 1700s. So they would look at us and think we're just doing little morsels here. <laughs> they wanted to see the, the services saturated with the word of God. And, and it's, the, it's the word of God that lifts us heavenward. It's the word of God that feeds and nourishes, teaches and instructs and gives us the direction we need to live our lives, the encouragement we need, the hope that we need to have. I um, titled today's message, What Child Is This? I was going to just call the message, Who Is This Child? But then I thought I would go with the hymn title, <laughs> What Child Is This? Today we're going to be looking at Matthew and Luke and as to what they're saying, what's revealed in the narratives of the birth of Christ, what it reveals about who he is. And then next week, we're going to look at the Gospel of John and what it reveals about who Jesus is in the introductory verses of chapter 1, verses 1 through 18 of John's Gospel. So today, we're going to look at Matthew first. If you want to open to Matthew chapter 1. I was spending a lot of time in the last few weeks just reading over the different narratives of the birth of Jesus Christ and uh, that is probably what impacted me the most, is there's, there's so much revealed about who this person is. And I hope that we will see that. And then what does it mean to us that he is these things, what the scriptures reveal about him? I don't think there's going to be anything brand new for any of us. Uh, there shouldn't be any new revelation. There is no such thing. But... I hope it grabs us in a new way, and in a way that will encourage us and strengthen us in our faith. Okay, Matthew chapter 1, what I'm going to do is read through the narrative, and then we'll look back at some of the verses as to what it reveals about Jesus Christ. I'm going to read starting with verse 18, and we're going to read through Matthew chapter 2, verse 15. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, came from the east, or from the east, came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born, king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. 
For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and there remained until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt. I have called my son. A couple points I'd like to bring out first of all is in verse 18. It says, now the birth. What's interesting is that's actually not in the Greek language. It's not the word for birth at all. In fact, we title our, the very, very first book of the Bible with the word that's used here. It's the word Genesis. This is the beginning. This is the source, the origin, the start of the story, the account of the incarnate Son of God. Also, the, I think most of us are probably aware of this as well, that the, to be betrothed, um, there were, uh, during this time of betrothal, there were no sexual relationships between the man and the woman. Um, but it was actually a much more binding relationship than what engagement is to people today. And um, it was actually a legal um, uh, agreement between the two for marriage and it would actually um, it, it could actually only be broken by an official divorce notice of divorce so it was a much greater commitment than it is, than an engagement would be today it would actually take a legal legal action to separate the two of them it's something for us to keep in mind we see that m m wise men from the east or from the rising of the sun, these were magi. The Greek magi, which means magician. It means sage of the magician religion, possibly astrologer. But what's interesting is this, this, I guess, walk of life, if you will, these sages had developed by the time of Christ. And it would have included wise men who had searched and studied various sacred writings. So these weren't necessarily astrologers as we would know an astrologer today. These were men, uh, people who would study sacred writings. And no doubt they came across some writings that would have told them that there would be a king over Jerusalem and who knows how else they came across that information. But what's interesting is when you read the prophets in the Old Testament and uh, one of the things you see prophesied is that the day would come when Gentiles, and we see this in Isaiah the prophet for example, when Gentile nations would come up to Jerusalem and they would seek the instruction of the Lord and we see something here, even when Jesus is yet just a newborn baby, we see the beginning 
of fulfillment. God letting us know that he is fulfilling his covenants, his purposes, and his promises. No matter what happens throughout the life of this child as he grows into adulthood, even when he goes all the way to the crucifixion of the cross, God is letting us know that he is absolutely fulfilling all of his plan and purposes. We begin to see even here this interest as Gentiles travel from a far nation to come and acknowledge the king. We see something else though, don't we? When Herod had gathered the chief priests and the leaders together to find out where the king was to be born, they just simply told him, okay? They saw, they saw all that was going on in Jerusalem, how everybody was stirred up by the coming of these wise men. And by the way, there weren't three kings. That's just a tradition. Um, they weren't kings to begin with. They were just considered sages or wise men. And there may have been tons of them. We don't know. The, the, the idea of three comes from the fact that there were three gifts given. But there may have been a, quite a, an entourage coming into Jerusalem. And what's interesting is in Matthew 2.2, 2, when it says that they were saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? This word saying, according to one commentary I was reading, says this is a present participle. Now, isn't that exciting? <laughs> it's a present participle. Let's rejoice. <laughs> What it means, though, is this. It implies that what was happening is that the Magi were going all about asking everywhere, where is he? Where is this one who's king of the Jews? They didn't just say it once. They were saying it over and over. So they, you have this entourage coming into Jerusalem, and you have these, these sages, these foreigners coming in and saying, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? Kind of interesting, too, perhaps, that we see Gentiles announcing his birth. <laughs> but, what, but even with all of this going on, with all of Jerusalem turned upside down and stirred, saying, what's going on? What does all this mean? The religious establishment doesn't seem all that interested. They give, they give um, Herod the information he wants, and that's all we ever hear about them. Perhaps maybe that's an omen or perhaps a portent of what is to come as Israel will reject their king. Not all Jews reject their king at this time, but a majority of them do and a remnant does not. Perhaps we're seeing the beginnings of that rejection and the welcoming of the Gentile world. Isn't that interesting? Something else that I want to point out as we look at the fact that this is a virgin birth, no matter what higher critical liberal scholars are wanting to pretend. Whenever the angel addresses Joseph about taking the child into Egypt and then later to bring him back, he always calls him the child. He never calls him your child. He calls Jesus the child. And, um, and when he speaks of Mary, he doesn't say, your wife. He calls her the young child's mother. So whenever Mary and the child Jesus also, and this is something interesting, in the narrative, when Mary and Jesus are mentioned together, the child Jesus is always mentioned first, and then Mary is mentioned. So if you meditate on that passage in Matthew, you'll see those interesting facts. And remember, to Joseph, Jesus was the child. He was not his father. He was legally his father, but not biologically. And of course, Mary is literally his mother. So there again we see the virgin birth. We see our humanity passed on to Jesus through Mary, but we also see the deity of Christ through the virgin birth as the Holy Spirit 
came on Mary and she conceived. Isn't that interesting the way the Holy Spirit inspired and orchestrated the writing of this narrative? Okay, so who is this child that we're talking about? Who is this child that's born? Why is his birth so important? Why do we even think of celebrating it? The first thing I'd like to point out is in chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew starts his gospel out. The whole New Testament starts with these words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That connects it immediately, of course, to the Old Testament. But we see that Jesus Christ has a genealogy, that he has a connection to history. He's not a made-up myth. Secondly, his name is Yeshua. The Lord saves, or the Lord is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. That's his name, Yeshua. And Christ, Christos, or Messiah. He is Yeshua, Messiah. But he's the son of David, meaning he's the one promised to David in the covenant that God made with David that one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever, that Israel would have a king, and that king would be a son of David. But he's also the son of Abraham. What does that mean? <laughs> it means he's the fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham. All of the promises made through to Abraham that his descendants, that he and his descendants would be a blessing to all the world, find their fulfillment in this one, Jesus Christ. He is the seed of Abraham. So how does the New Testament start? How does the Gospel of Matthew start? It starts by saying, as loud as possible, God is fulfilling all of his promises, his plans, and his purposes. He is faithful to King David in fulfilling the Davidic covenants, and he is faithful to Abraham in fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant. And you and I, if we know our scriptures and know what those covenants are about, can know that he has every intention of blessing all the nations of the world, bringing the knowledge of salvation to the whole world. Isn't that exciting? We see fulfillment. One of the reasons that gives me hope is because if he's fulfilling it, through all those dark times and bumpy roads throughout the Old Testament, I mean, it, it got pretty bad at times. <laughs> but no matter what the world does, no matter what wicked rulers do, no matter what Nebuchadnezzar did, no matter what the Assyrian Empire did, and the Babylonian Empire, and the Persian Empire, and the Grecian Empire, no matter how wicked Antiochus Epiphanes was, or any of those, no matter what the world or the devil threw at God's plan, God's plan went forward. And I have every reason to believe that there is no Nebuchadnezzar, there is no Darius the Mede, there is no, no world leader anywhere that can thwart the plan of God. When Jesus Christ says to us, Fear not, little flock, for it's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We know that we are heirs of the kingdom, and we will partake in it forever and in the life that he's come to give us. Isn't that good news? So right away, the very, very first verse, we see enough theology to bless our socks off. <laughs> We see that God fulfills his plan and his purposes. We see that Jesus Christ is a historical person, that he is Yeshua, Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Again in verse 17 of chapter 1, So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. He is the Messiah, that's revealed immediately. Who is this child? 
He's the fulfillment of the plan, the purposes, and the covenants of God, the, the fulfillment of all the promises of God. That's who he is. He is Yeshua. He is the Messiah. In verses 18 to 21, which we have read, we see that he is Jesus. In verse 21, you shall bear, he, she, she, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. Not only does he come into the world as a king, as the Messiah, but he comes as one who will rescue us from our sins. I've heard preachers say before, and this is a good point to bring out, it did not say in this verse, he has come to save us in our sins. He's come to save us from our sins. Otherwise, God doesn't wink and say, go ahead, I know you're human, sin all you like. No, he came to save us from our sins. And today, as believers in Jesus Christ and our union with him, sin's control and power over us is broken. And someday in Christ, in the great day, in the resurrection, we will forever be even saved from the presence of sin itself. He comes to save his people from their sins. In verse 23, when it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. We learn something about Jesus there. Not only is he the one who saves us from our sins, but his name is Emmanuel, which means God with us. You could ask, well, how could God really, really, really be with us if we're all in sin? So he, he had to come to rescue us and save us from our sin so that he would dwell in our midst. You could say, well, wait a second. Didn't he dwell in the midst of Israel inside the tabernacle? In the, over, over, over the tabernacle inside uh, of the tent? Didn't, didn't he dwell in the midst of the people over the Ark of the Covenant, I meant within the tabernacle? Yeah, but you know, in a sense concealed and hidden. Only the high priest once a year could actually go into the Holy of Holies. God's presence with us, he wants it to be more real. He wants us, he wants to be with every single one of us. You know that we see a hint of this as I've been studying the book of Acts, like I told you. Um, we see a hint of this on the day of Pentecost. You know, in the Old Testament, when they saw the Shekinah glory of God, they saw this big, like a pillar of fire and smoke. And even over the tabernacle, as, as the Jews traveled in the wilderness, they would see that pillar of fire come down over the tabernacle. But on, on the day of Pentecost, what do you see? You see this flame of fire, this tongue of fire on the head of every single individual. That's the difference. God wants to dwell uniquely in every single person. God's desire is to be with us. And not just that he would be with us, but God's passion, his heart, his desire and Emmanuel is he wants us to know he's with us. He wants us to know his presence. And though our eyes are still veiled in this life, someday that, that veil that's upon our eyes are, is removed. And as Revelation 22 verse 4 says, not only will we serve and worship him, but we will see him. No longer will that curse be on us. Like when God told Moses, no man can see me and live. No, Yeshua, Messiah, has come, and he shall save his people from their sins that God might be Emmanuel, not just so that he can be near us, but so that we can know the joy, the excitement, and the thrill, the rapture, if you will, 
of seeing His presence. God wants us to have that delight. God wants us to have that joy. I think of a parent. If someone is a parent of a child who's born blind, and as that child grows and grows up and goes through life, and that parent really, really loves their child, wouldn't they have a longing? Wouldn't they have a longing for that child's eyes to be opened? To see the beauties of a sunrise or a sunset. To see the beauty of flowers, of the, the glorious creation, or the great beautiful mountains that God has created. Wouldn't they want their child to have that thrill, that joy, that fulfillment? People, I believe God in his word is revealing something about his heart to us. He wants to totally remove our sin so that he can be Emmanuel in our midst. Not just that he would be near us, though he longs to be in our midst, but so that you and I could see him and have the joy of seeing the glory of almighty God. Moses cried out. There's a hint of it, an echo of it in the past when Moses says, oh, let me see your glory. <laughs> and this, it's almost like God saying, yes, someday, someday that will happen. That's why the very next day on the mountain, God comes down, chapter 34 of Exodus, and walks before Moses after putting him in the cleft of the rock. And he calls himself the compassionate God, the gracious God, one who forgives transgression, iniquity, and sin, using all the main Hebrew words for sin. And as I've explained before, and probably don't need to say it again, but the word forgiving there, bara, in the Greek, excuse me, the Hebrew language, means to lift up and carry. So God reveals something to Moses. God reveals himself as gracious and compassionate, a God who will lift up and carry himself your iniquities and sins and transgressions. Why? Not just because you need forgiveness, but so that, Moses, I can fulfill your petition from the day before. You can see my glory. Wow. There is so much here, I'm not going to be able to do my whole outline. <laughs> it's just, the scripture is so rich. Something else that should dawn with us in a huge way. When it says this child is born, and this child is coming into the world to save his people from their sins, it should indicate to us that the biggest problem that we have is sin. That's what's wrong with the world. When you say, what's wrong with the world? What's wrong with me? The big problem is sin. And something else should be made very clear to us. There's nothing you and I can do about it. We need to be rescued from it. All the religious ceremonies in the world, all of our good works are, quote, merit if there's if we deceive ourselves into thinking there is any such thing as our own merit. All the good works, all the fasting, all the praying, all the religion can't rescue us. God himself had to have the rescue plan. And he is the rescue plan. He comes and takes upon himself our humanity in order to free us from sin. You see, because the wages of sin is death. And who can give themselves the gift of life? We can't produce life, any kind of life. We can't make it happen. We're lost in trespasses and sins. And only God can give life. All life comes from him. In him is life. In his life is the light of the world. In him, in Christ, his life 
Peter on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, says that Jesus Christ is the author of life. He is life itself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Sin, the wages of sin is death. Eternal separation from Almighty God, that's what death is. Ultimately, it's separation. Jesus Christ came into the world not to make us into good people so we turn over a new leaf. Jesus came into the world to raise the dead to life to remove our sin as far as the east is from the west in order that God may be Emmanuel in our midst, that he would be with us and that we would have him. Oh, we have no idea. We have no idea how awesome God is, how big he really is, how powerful. I mean, we get a hint of it, right? The other day I was watching the sun come up I was in a, and I could only look for just like a second, and you know, you're blinded immediately because it's so bright. God simply spoke that into existence. Where did the flame come from? Where did the nitrogen come from? Where did, the, where did all that come from? He just spoke it into existence, and it was there. Out of nothing, people. We get an idea that, who, like, who is this person? He's magnificent. And God says, I have a plan. I have a plan that for all eternity you can have me. Oh, man. That I can dwell in your midst. That we can have a relationship. That we can communicate. That we can talk. That every day I'll, I'll reveal something new about me to you. God is Emmanuel. In verses 1 through 12, he is revealed as the king of the Jews. I want to close with the point that he is the king. We see that he is Yeshua. We see that he was born of a woman. He saves us from our sin. We see that he's the son of David, the son of Abraham, the Messiah. The fulfillment of all of God's covenants and promises. We see in verses 2, 6, and 15, and of, chap of chapter 2, excuse me, verses 6 and 15, and of chapter 1, verse 23, that he fulfills prophecy. But we also see that he is the king. Where is he who is born king of the Jews? We saw his star as it was rising. In Jeremiah chapter 23, it says this. Let me just read these two verses to you. 23 verses 5 and 6. The prophet Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteous in the land. Interestingly, for the, mind, for the Jewish person in the land meant their land. Not just on the earth in general, though we know Jesus Christ is king over all. But for the Jewish person in the land meant their land. So God would raise up a king who would rule in their land, who would deal wisely, and he would reign as a king. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Isn't that awesome? The Lord is our righteousness. I don't have my own. Yahweh himself is our righteousness. And people, how is that possible? But through the cross of Christ, 
by which our sins are removed. How is that possible? Unless it's all a grace, what can you do to earn Yahweh as your own? <laughs> what religious ceremony can you do to get God to be yours? Boy, God reveals something about it himself, doesn't he? He has made himself vulnerable. He has exposed his heart. He's exposed himself as a lover. He's exposed himself as one who longs to be with his children. He's exposed himself as one who longs for you to see him. He says, in my heart, I have a plan that will obliterate all barriers so that I can dwell with you and you can dwell with me. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be right there in the midst of you and you know, you'll be right there in my presence. I will love you and you will love me. I will look into your eyes and you will look into mine. And as God told Abraham at one time in chapter 15 of Genesis, he says, I am your shield. A shield is a king, by the way. I am your king, and I am your exceeding great reward. That's what Jesus came to accomplish, to be our king, and that the Lord himself would be our righteousness, dwelling in our midst, so we will learn the, the, the true purpose of the plan of God, that he would reign as king over all, that we would have hearts surrendered to the king, that the devil's lie would be exposed, that God was somehow holding something back. That's what he said to Adam and Eve. No, he's not holding anything back. He has so much to give us. So on that day, as Revelation 22, 4 says, when we will see his face, we will say, my shield and my exceeding great reward. Because you gave yourself to be my king and my reward. He himself, people, is our reward. He gives himself. He gives himself. That is so powerful, the Lord, our righteousness. Praise God. Let's pray. God, our Father, our hearts absolutely thrill at this news that that baby that was born 2,000 years ago and laid in a manger where animals eat. Was the fulfillment, was the fulfillment of the promises and the hope that someday all will be totally fulfilled. And God will dwell in our midst and we will see God and we will have God forever. Father, drive this truth home to us. Let it burn in our hearts. Make us passionately hungry for you. And give us the joy of knowing that hunger, that thirst will all be fulfilled when we see his face. Father, this we pray. And we cry out to you, Lord, in all of this that you are accomplishing. May you be glorified, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. He's good, isn't he?